Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Dave Schechter. Uh, I am a freelance writer, a journalist who uh, has for the last several weeks been writing a great deal about COVID-19 and its impact on the Atlanta Jewish community in particular. And there, a couple of the articles have had to do with uh, uh, the situation involving elderly residents. And it was in that capacity that uh, I was asked by uh, guests to moderate this program. So let me introduce them since they are the experts. First is uh, Rabbi Pamela Gottfried of Congregation Beit Haverim and Your Jewish Bridge, which you see, uh, you may see the logo when she speaks. Now, Your Jewish Bridge is a project of Congregation Beit Haverim that is partly funded by a Propel Innovation Grant from the Federation the Jewish Federation of Greater Atlanta. The idea is to serve the needs of unaffiliated Jews in the metro area. My other guest today is Nancy Kreisman, who is a licensed clinical social worker with many years, she can say how many if she'd like, many years experience uh, helping uh, families uh, and elderly interact and deal with uh, the, the maze from uh, everything from emotional issues to practical issues, some of which we're going to get into here today. Uh, she has a great deal of work in uh, helping family members who are experiencing the enforced distancing, which is why everyone here is in a separate room, and not virtually. And uh, in the nursing facilities, and we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, Jewish home life and uh, any other facilities in general or in specific that I guess wish to mention. Now, uh, I am the moderator. I am not going to be controlling who is speaking, but in the interests of, uh, uh, of the way these are supposed to go, if everyone will mute themselves, then I will uh, uh, proceed and we will get started. Now, the first uh, person I want to introduce, and she will have some remarks to make, is, uh, is Rabbi Gottfried. And I will ask her if she would please, in Jewish terms, give us a framing for this conversation so that uh, we have a foundation from which to work. Thanks, Dave. Um, so where we wanted to start off was uh, to talk about sort of the prime directives uh, in Jewish values. Uh, one which I think everybody is probably familiar with, which is honoring and caring for um, one's parents. So honor your mother and father or honor your father and mother uh, is right there in the top 10, the 10 commandments, both in Exodus and Deuteronomy. And it's the only commandment that is given, which explicitly mentions a reward for performing it. So if you honor your mother and your father, you will endure long on the land that God has given to us. Um, and then it's repeated again in Leviticus, in what's known as, um, in Leviticus 19, which is often referred to as the holiness code, you shall revere your mother and your father and keep my Sabbaths, I'm the Lord your God. So the way to be, um, to uphold these two Jewish values is uh, of honoring and caring for your parents and respecting your parents um, is right there in these prime directives. The second place we find it, or the, maybe the lesser known one, is respecting the elderly. In Leviticus 19, also in the Holiness Code, it says, Mipne sevat takum, you shall rise up before the aged and show deference to the old. Sometimes in the old translation, it says, rise up before the hoary head. And what they mean is uh, showing respect for the elderly. You shall fear your God, for I am the Lord. So those, um, those two values of honoring and caring for your parents and respecting the elderly I would say are the prime directives in, Ju in Judaism and Jewish values. And um, we'll talk a little bit later about visiting the sick. I'm gonna pass it back to uh, Nancy or to you, Dave, to talk about um, practically how that plays out. So we move from the, uh, the religious foundation to the practical applications. And uh, Nancy, if you would give us uh, your uh, introduction on, uh, from your perspective on uh, this issue of uh, the elderly and distancing and the experiences that we're all going through? Well, it seems to me um, what families are really asking a lot of questions around is how do I stay connected to my um, elder family member? 
um, whether they're in their own home or whether they're in assisted living or nursing home. And there are some different ways you do that according to where they're living. Um, because they're very concerned about, you know, are they safe? Are they um, getting any type of interaction and engagement? Um, do they understand why we're having to be in isolation in a sense? Um, you know, why can't you come over and visit? You know, th th that's a question that a lot of the family members hear from their elder family members um, and struggle with how to e explain it to them. And particularly that can be, um, and we'll talk about this when you're dealing with somebody who has cognitive impairment and dementia. So um, what I'd like to be able to do, Dave, is, um, is you know, dig into talking about some of the emotions and feelings, um, if that would be okay. Yeah, I think that gives us a good bridge uh, to move into questions. I want to tell uh, the folks who are, are watching this that uh, in the chat function on Zoom, if you have questions, uh, please put them there. And if you would be good enough, if it's for Nancy, put, just say uh, for Nancy, or if it's for Rabbi Gottfried, to Rabbi Gottfried, and I trust there won't be any questions for me. And uh, we'll move now into the question uh, phase of this. And I'm going to come back to Nancy with the broadest question that we're going to discuss, that's going to be asked. And, and Nancy and I did a, uh, a radio podcast. Uh, so we've covered some of this ground before uh, in a podcast that we did for the Atlanta Jewish Times. Uh, so the two-part question is the concerns. On the one hand, what are the, the, the concerns of the elders? What are the concerns of the family members? And I have a couple of sub-questions to that, but you know, there, there's issues, as you said, of loneliness, anxiety, safety. There's all kinds of uh, concerns going both ways. So if you would start with the concerns of the elders and then into the, the perspective from the family members, please. Sure. sure. Actually, one of the number one um, concerns that I hear older people um, share with me is that they're afraid that their family members are going to get COVID. And, you know, not so much, I mean, I think they are themselves afraid, but it's not something they typically will voice as much. It's more that they're worried about their daughters and sons and grandchildren, et cetera. So um, fear is, is, a, is, is something that needs to be addressed. And, and obviously you can't say to them, mom, I'm never gonna get COVID, but here, these are the things I'm trying to do to better take care of myself and do the best I can around it. Um, another thing is, you know, worry, which is very common. Worry and guilt are two common <laughs> issues that us Jews face, but older people in particular, um, they worry, you know, about finances for their family members because some of them know that, you know, some of their family members are not working now. You know, they worry about health. They worry about when they're going to get to see their, their family members or um, so there's a lot of different things around worry. And sadness is another biggie. And it kind of falls in with loneliness to some degree. A, a fair amount of my older folks have shared with me, you know, they just feel sad because they miss their family members. And that's particularly true of people who are living in their own homes. Um, those folks that are in nursing homes, although they have been quarantined, many of them to their apartments, um, or their rooms, that has changed. Um, it's starting to change as we're opening up a little bit more. We can, you know, address that. Another thing that um, I'm seeing with some of my elders is they they get impatient and angry, and and that has more to do with I think folks that are just not grasping how serious this is and and what's involved with it. And I think the other thing is that when somebody has some cognitive impairment it makes this so much more difficult to understand. And, um, and we, again, like I said, we're, we're gonna talk about that. And then the last thing that I'm noticing that kind of fits in with the, the loneliness and the isolation is depression or anxiety. And we're seeing both of those. I mean, we're seeing that in general, in the general population, but you know, and older people are not the type that are gonna say to you, I feel depressed. I mean, especially the great generation, but they will, they will say things like, 
I don't want to talk to you or leave me alone or, um, you know, it'll be sort of an off comment, not directly, I'm depressed. And the anxiety you can see in them too, by the way they, they handle things. Well, that gives me uh, opportunity because when you and I and, and uh, Rabbi Gottfried were having our pre-conversations, uh, we had some personal chat about our various own, our own relatives. So, so uh, Rabbi, you, you, you had talked in, when we had that earlier conversation about geographic distance uh, mm -hmm. and you know, your kind, how, how that is affecting uh, your ability to communicate and, and the concerns. So uh, if you would uh, please uh, tell us a little bit more as you told Nancy and me during our pre-conversation. Um, sure, and then I, I might ask you to also share about uh, your geographic distance. So um, uh, both my in-laws and my parents, uh, thank God, are all living. My, um, my parents are in New Jersey. My dad is in New Jersey and my mom is in Florida, respectively. And, um, and my in-laws are in Michigan and Florida. And they, it's very interesting because our, our relationship, you know, over the last 30 years has been as they have aged and, um, and my father-in-law is actually physically not in great shape and suffers from dementia. He doesn't really understand um, why, why we're not coming to visit or why we're not getting together and why we had this Zoom Seder. And as we're trying to connect with them, first of all, there are like practical struggles um, with my dad. Uh, I was supposed to visit several times in the spring. I was supposed to be there a couple of weeks ago. I'm FaceTiming with him regularly, which is itself a struggle. But what comes up a lot is that um, it's impossible to say when I will be able to visit. And just because my brothers are there in New Jersey and delivering his groceries and taking care of him, there's, um, there's a frustration that comes through when I'm FaceTiming with him that um, he wants his doctor, he wants his daughter there. And I, I just canceled my trip for August because I don't think it's gonna be safe to, to go up there. And so that's, that's come up a lot. And you know why aren't the grandchildren, so he's seeing his grandchildren that are there, but it's a struggle to connect my kids with him. And now my son is working and he's very worried. So like, you know, um, all of this trying to, I'm worried about him and making sure that he's being compliant with the level of, um, of activity in COVID in, in New Jersey right now and the beaches are open and he's staying home and doing all the right things. But he's worried because, you know, he saw a picture of me on Facebook at, a, at, at the Capitol, um, you know, at a Black Lives Matters demonstration. And he's like, are you staying safe? And, you know, he sees things on the news and he's worried about me. And so it makes our interactions um, complicated, you know, when we're trying to stay in touch and keep it to keep it positive, there are all these complicating factors, and I see this worry going in both directions. So. Well, that, let me, uh, since you brought up my end, uh, my mm -hmm. sister Jane may be on this uh, program <laughs> watching, and I have to express a, a personal uh, thanks to her because she lives in downtown Chicago, about a 10 minute walk from our mother who lives on the 43rd floor of a high rise. And recently she's been able to start getting my mother out and going for walks because otherwise it's the exercise class on the closed circuit television, or it's uh, walking laps in the apartment, which is probably gets a little old very quickly. So I'm particularly grateful that, that I have a sister who's there where, where my mother, who's in her early nineties, uh, can help her because the other four siblings are strung out around the country. Uh, but this, the mobility thing raises uh, something that I wanted, to, I wanted to get into, and maybe this is the point to do it. Uh, I have been having conversations, those who read the Atlanta Jewish Times know I've written a great deal about some of the facilities at Jewish Home Life, which operates uh, a variety of different kinds of residential facilities and provides home services. And one of the issues that's been coming up more and more, I hear from uh, people, how shall I put this, of my age, is, well, I'd like to go visit. I'd like to go visit, but I can't. And, and, and I know, Nancy, you brought that up a moment ago. And I did ask Jewish Home Life about this uh, because in the Atlanta community and the Jewish community, a fair number of uh, people have relatives in, in one or more of those facilities. Uh, the uh, Georgia Healthcare Association, they told me, put out guidelines last week uh, for limited conditional outdoor visits. And Jewish Home Life said that it's uh, testing its processes this week. And today is June the 24th. 
and that they hope to be able to send the families some sort of directions for how to sign up uh, and, and how these visits are actually going to work. Get those uh, to the families sometime, you know, late this week, next week. I know some other facilities have already begun with this. Uh, I won't uh, name anyone, but there's a terribly cute story I know of a uh, couple who are dating uh, late 80s and early 90s, and she is in an assisted living, and she sits on one side of a fence, and her boyfriend sits on the other side of the fence, and they use their cell phones to talk to each other, and that is how they have been communicating, uh, these two, for about, you know, probably about three or four months now. Anyway, uh, so the mobility question is one that I think everyone will need to address at some point uh, as you deal with these questions. I want to come back uh, to, uh, uh, to both of the guests, but first to the rabbi. Uh, as you said, visiting the sick is the prime directive. Now, uh, if you can't, and because you're not allowed to, um, on a religious basis, you know, what, what, what is the religion? Does Judaism tell us what to do when we can't visit? I'm sure it doesn't tell us which technology to use, but what does Judaism tell us about uh, the, you know, fulfilling that obligation? That's a great question. Um, I had a little story from the Talmud that I was going to share, um, and I can put it in the chat afterwards. But um, there was a, one, of, one of the students of Rabbi Akiva became sick, and um, the sages would not go and visit him. It was obviously some kind of contagious disease. And so nobody was going to visit this guy. And then um, Rabbi Akiva himself you know, decided to visit and he instructed all of his students to go and take care of this guy, even though it was clearly whatever he had was contagious. And they swept and they sprinkled dirt, uh, water on the dirt floor and, and then he recovered. And so the student who was sick said to his teacher, my teacher, my rabbi, you revived me. And from this, we learned in the Talmud, Rabbi Akiva went out and taught, this is the prime directive, with regard to anyone who does not visit the ill, it is though he is spilling blood, as it could be that that sick person has no one to care for him. If there are no visitors, no one will know his situation and therefore no one will come to his aid. So back in Talmudic times, when there was no FaceTime and Zoom and technology and cell phones um, and airplanes. I mean, it was, it was really complicated and the prime directive really was you have to go and it's somebody has to take it on themselves to go in person um, and take that risk. Um, recently, one of my other professors, a uh, former professor, uh, just gave a, a lecture, I haven't had a chance to watch it yet, about um, how one must take on a certain personal risk in order to save a life. So if the loneliness and the frustration and the anxiety was so terrible, um, the, the basically Jewish law, the Jewish value in person and alleviate that pain. Um, and so that, um, that's something I've been struggling with now. So what, what can we do? Um, I have done uh, pastoral visits on Zoom. I did a phone call. Um, you didn't ask about this, but in, in the case of someone being really ill, or um, not aware, uh, I was called and asked if I could uh, do a vidui, a confessional bedside prayer, um, basically for someone who was close to death, who was in a deep coma um, by phone. And I called the caregiver and she put me on speaker and I said this prayer. And there is some, uh, some research, I guess, that says that the person being prayed for is aware on some level that you are praying for their, for their well-being, even if they don't know that they're being pray, prayed for and even if they're in a deep coma. I so we can say prayers and we can, do, we can use the technology to visit. Yeah. I'll tell you, I wrote a story recently about exactly that. Uh, a fellow from here in Atlanta whose father was passing away at, at his home in Charlotte. And the gentleman from Atlanta had uh, struck a friendship up and davened at uh, in, uh, Chabad in town with Rabbi Schusterman. And he called Rabbi Schusterman, who, using FaceTime, did the vidui. Uh, it's probably, he said, it's an extremely emotional thing to do in person, uh, let, alone, let alone doing it over the phone. So, uh, Nancy, what, what the rabbi has said uh, then comes to the practical side. 
yes, we know that in the times of the Talmud, the electronics that we rely on today weren't available, but now we move to the present and they are available. So caring at a distance, uh, two parts to this. Uh, there is the practical, how do you do it? And then there is the question about uh, being a good advocate, because as you're trying to care for someone from a distance, you know, communicate with them, you also want to be their advocate. And I think that's something that a lot of families feel has been lost here, is that if they can't visit their relative directly, uh, even a phone call or, or a FaceTime or a Zoom, but if they can't see them, it's very hard for them to advocate for uh, their best interest with the staff of a facility, for example. I want to toss one of the questions in here uh, that says, and this is to Nancy, uh, any ideas for how to handle personal frustration with the limits in our abilities to assist isolated, lonely seniors? So I drop on you here uh, everything from uh, caring at a distance on a practical to uh, how to handle uh, the frustration issue and, and adv advocacy, please. Well, I'm going to start out by saying that I think, and this doesn't answer this particular question, but it needs to be put out there, that not being able to touch is very difficult. And, you know, we can, we can Zoom and we can FaceTime and we can GrandPad and all these, you know, all these different technologies, but nothing ever replaces the human touch and the presence, the human presence. So I, I just want to say that, and, and that is something that, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with um, trying to figure out how to help families around that when they're not able, because now some places are opened up and they can actually, I'm going this, this uh, Thursday to see my mother-in-law at an assisted living community, and we're going to share lunch together, but we're going to be, you know, six or seven feet apart, and, um, and we're, I'm not going to be able to hug her, or she's not going to be able to hug me, you know. Um, and that's not easy. Um, I mean, we're fortunate that there are lots of different ways that we can stay connected, not only just tech, but I think, I think the low tech stuff is very important. So, you know, getting grandchildren involved um, and great grands writing letters, um, you know, sending, um, you know, balloons that say, I love or miss you, um, you know, care packages. I, I know that in the community, my, my mother-in-law lives and you have to, if you give a care package, it has to sit out for like 24 hours or something. Um, but then she gets it. And, and you can, you know, make the care packages have a lot of fun things in them. They have pictures of the grandchildren and the, and the family, things that, that where they travel together, perhaps. Um, so there's a lot of what I call low tech ways. Um, you know, perhaps even sending a teddy bear. I mean, I, you know, sometimes it might sound juvenile, but it's something to hold, you know, this is Teddy and we're, we're just wanting you to know that we love you and you can hug Teddy, you know, and believe it or not, even people who don't have dementia can appreciate that. You're on mute, Dave. Oh, now I'm off mute, I hope. And I've just, that provides a segue, but I wanted to say something before I get to the, the, the question. Uh, I have a mother-in-law who uh, is in a, uh, a hospice unit, dementia unit, uh, in, uh, outside of Austin, Texas. And one of my wife's sisters lives in that area. So uh, she has found it very effective to get to know the caregivers. Because if you can't go there yourself and you can't interact as easily from the distance, even with technology, the relationship with the caregiver, if you have the opportunity, has been very important because you can get some reports back, some information. You have something of an advocate because when you can't go and visit, you don't have the ability to turn to the staff and say, look, this needs to be done or this isn't happening. But you made the question about dementia. And, and this has got to be one of the really tough, tough issues here. These are the folks who don't, don't know where they are sometimes. Um, certainly have no understanding of what is happening in the outside world, so to speak. 
including COVID and why all of a sudden even their caregivers are wearing masks and shields and gloves where they may have a memory that a few months ago they were not. So I, wa I want to start this one, uh, if I could, with Nancy, but then to the rabbi. Uh, what do you do to help the relatives with dementia that you cannot visit and you really cannot, it's, cannot communicate with through electronics? What can you do? Now you're muted. It, yeah, now I'm muted. Um, it takes me back to an finishing answering the advocacy question um, because I think that's important um, that, you know, when you can't visit somebody, um, then what you were talking about is super important. And I've always said to families, the minute somebody walk, goes into a nursing home or assisted living, or even is, has somebody coming into the home, you absolutely have to develop a relationship you know, with that person so that you then determine which caregivers or caregiver might be the one that can really do the best job at helping calm your family member, helping perhaps to show pictures if they can't quite remember, you know, because they have dementia. Um, so that that's extremely important. And, you know, um, finding out, and because I, I got to finish this advocacy thing, it's important just to make sure to see, to make sure you have a caregiver that can show what your family member looks like, particularly if they're in a nursing home, to see, do they look physically okay? You know, do they look like they're being fed and, and hydrated properly? And do they have on clean clothes? Um, and, and notice whether or not they're changing their clothes. Um, and just get a better sense, or are they moving them around? Are they just sitting in their apartment by themselves? With, you know, are they in bed only? Are they in a chair? I mean, all those sorts of things are really important to pay attention to. Um, so those are things that I highly encourage you know, people to look at in terms of advocacy. In terms of dementia and talking um, with people around um, dealing with this, I mean, you have to just be in the moment. And so the idea is when you're connecting with somebody and just talk as if you're right there with them as best you can, um, mom, I, I really, I love you. Um, I'm giving you, um, a big hug. Can you feel it? Even though, you know, it's in your hug is in my is in, in your heart. I mean, you can do some things that the main thing is staying in the moment. Um, and if they ask you, well, why um, can't you come visit me? You can say, um, I'm visiting with you right now. I love you. I'm talking to you. Um, you know, because they're not going to be able to quite understand. And so trying to explain to somebody who has dementia does not work. Well, then that's a rabbi, obviously uh, providing Jewish services, um, you know, in person is different than online. So in, in these cases that, that, that Nancy's talking about, when you have loved ones who uh, whose mental faculties are really not capable of comprehending the, the larger picture. How do you interact with them Jewishly when you're in a situation like this? How does that element stay in their lives? Yeah, um, it's a great question. I agree with everything that Nancy said, and it, it made me think about how um, particularly with um, parents, elderly parents who are having um, both physical and um, and cognitive, you know, uh, struggles, challenges, that even in medieval times, um, part of respecting your parent and caring for your parent, that prime directive that we talked of earlier, was appointing someone who could do it for you. And so this idea of, of having that caregiver um, and having that relationship and having that caregiver uh, be the you that you can, you're not there on the inside, um, the, the, for me as a rabbi, when I've been um, helping people in this situation most recently in the last few months, I found that, um, that the pastoral needs of the family members, which is kind of why we wanted to have this conversation, right? That I am rabbinating um, and pastoring to the, the family members who are struggling with this. And um, this idea of being in the moment and being grateful for um, 
you know, not over explaining, especially uh, I do have some clients who have um, elderly parents or partners uh, that are struggling with dementia that are in facilities that they can't visit them and, and the phone calls don't even really work. Um, that but keeping it really simple and saying, I'm visiting with you now and not talking about not being allowed to visit, not frightening them because they can't really understand that. Um, and then I am I'm having a lot of conversations with the family member who is struggling. Uh, and I saw, I don't know, um, some of them came in on the chat, but some of them came to me privately. A lot of people are saying they feel really guilty, right? And what about risking, you know, well, you can't take a personal risk and, and go visit because you're also causing risk, you know, to other people. So no, no, none of the rabbis say that you should do that. And I noticed that Gabby Spat is on the call. Um, I don't know if y'all are familiar with the Blue Dove Foundation, but um, she had offered a resource, which I'm putting in the chat now, um, that they had put up a social distancing gratitude resources. And that's really for, I mean, it can be, I guess, for your, your family member who is, um, who is uh, not, you're not able to visit, but um, it's really for us, right? It's for those of us that are struggling with that guilt. It's kind of finding that moment of, um, of gratitude of what we can do. Well, I'll tell you, and I think I'm, yes, I'm unmuted. Uh, I appreciate seeing all these questions in the chat. Uh, when we had our pre-conversation, there was a phrase used that I had never heard before, and <laughs> both of you know what it, this is. One of you, and you raise your hand, because I, one of you, please explain the meaning of the phrase compassionate deception, which we chuckled about. But Nancy, compassionate deception, not lying, just not telling the entire truth. And after you speak about that, uh, one of the questions that came in, and this may fit, compassionate deception may fit this, how do you balance the senior's desire to get out of the facility? How do you balance that, their desire to socialize? Uh, how do you balance that with keeping them safe? Is this where compassionate deception comes in? When you have to balance this or no, you're shaking your head. No, no, actually, um, compassionate deception is really to be used primarily with people who have dementia. Because the idea of it is that you can't always, you know, you want to reason with somebody and explain and, and, and all that and you just can't. And so sometimes it's better to use compassionate deception for example, when I used to visit my mother, she would hate when I would leave. And so what I learned to do through compassionate deception is just say, mom, I've got to go use the restroom. And then I would leave. Now, you can't do that with somebody who has cognitive ability. Um, it's not fair to them. And, you know, when you talk about the whole business of my father left the retirement community twice against the rules, he doesn't understand the danger. He's an adult. And as long as he has his cognitive abilities and capabilities, he has the right to leave. Um, I, think and I, want, I want to interject. I, I think there's something here, and I see a lot of this on various online forums where people are talking about uh, things opening up and uh, people are complaining, uh, viscerally complaining about not being able to go visit with a family member and someone will chime in and say, well, you can just take them out of there. There must be some practical considerations, uh, contracts, rules that, that limit the ability to just go in and, and take a family member home, for example. I mean, there are, and I, I have a client that got so frustrated with the whole thing. Her father actually hurt him, fell and hurt himself and ended up in the hospital. And he was living in an assisted living at the time. And she just decided to take him back to her home and hire um, private caregivers instead of going back to the assisted living because she, wa she really wanted to be able to physically visit him and the facility would not allow for that. Now, there are some facilities that are allowing you to come visit. Like I said, I'm going to see my mother-in-law. But in terms of really being able to do the kind of advocacy that 
I usually recommend people do is spending a lot of time, you know, different times of the day, you, you can't do that. And that makes it hard. Um, it, it's a tough one. Uh, it really is because older people, if they get COVID, they can easily die from it. I mean, they're the most vulnerable of all the population, right? And we've seen this, we've seen this particularly here in Georgia. Uh, uh, it's, it's a really, really unfortunate statistic that somewhere in the range of close to, if not half, of the COVID-related deaths in the state of Georgia have been in, I hate to use the word facilities, but nursing home, assisted living residences. Uh, so, I mean, the danger is very, very clearly there. Now, I will say one thing about uh, the relative who has the ability to leave. Uh, and I say this one uh, because I'm aware of a case personally, where it may be that when they're in an assisted living, they still have their car. So, uh, you know, and they may feel like, I have the right to leave. I have the right to go where I want. I'm going to get in the car. Well, at a certain point, you know, families, and there must be people on this call, I'm sure, who've been through this, have to have that conversation. You may be in assisted living. You may be in independent living. You may be at home. But the keys, we're taking them because you're not able to, to handle that. And it just gets back to this, this desire, uh, like the couple who's sitting on opposite sides of the fence. They're planning a cruise for next year. Um, God bless them. They're planning a cruise in their late 80s and early 90s. Uh, but they're separated by a fence. I call my mother almost, almost every day. And I can talk to her on a Facebook portal or I can, you know, FaceTime. But go to Chicago and visit. I'm not able to get on an airplane right now. That's a, that's a long drive. I really worry that a lot of uh, our elders uh, are losing some sort of mental connection with us without being, because of that lack of tactile response. Uh, Rabbi, when, as you say, you know, when you're dealing with families, and this, this same issue, um, the, the, the relative wants to get out of the facility, socialize, have a life, um, but you want them to keep, you've got to keep them safe. In your experience talking with families, what are you telling them? Um, it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, I have, the families that I'm uh, speaking with, they are not... Um, they're, they're being more cautious than maybe um, some of us are being in Georgia. I was actually on the highway yesterday and I, I don't want myself driving on the highway, let alone my kid or an elder. <laughs> you know, um, people are, there's a general sense of um, uh, kind of being let out, you know, too soon, <laughs> uh, furloughed, uh, you know, from uh, like, it's like a prison break out there. And, um, and that worries me. So I haven't had that experience, but where I am, having that experience is um, talking to people who want to gather and um, in other religious settings, you know, want to have, um, I'm doing a wedding actually, a socially distanced um, COVID, you know, hybrid Zoom wedding. Haley is going to Zoom master for me um, with a couple. It's a second marriage. They're, they're each 67 and um, it's about sort of setting those boundaries in advance uh, and they, in their invitation, they basically, first of all, they've ordered masks and hand sanitizer as party favors for their 10 guests. <laughs> um, and we'll be 14 people and everybody will be in pods six, six feet apart. But there's um, the duration of the exposure, you know, the duration of the, um, of the visit is also a concern. It's not just the distance, it's also the amount of time and how many individual interactions and who, who else have you had an interaction with. And so I'm really counseling people that even though it is, it's terrible and it's frustrating and that not being able to hug or be in close contact for more than a short period of time is, is, a terrible, is exacting a terrible cost. I think it's necessary right now. We just don't know, you know what two weeks is gonna look like from now. And, and, and you spoke about the, the hotspots. 
you know, they were in religious services and funerals, right, also that we know that those were the ground zero of, of some of the hotspots also on the beaches now. So um, really counseling people just to be cautious, even though the cost is terrible, and to try to do some of those things that Nancy was suggesting, and, and you know, I'm hugging you through the phone, I can't wait until I'll be able to hug you in person. When you're dealing with someone who is not cognitively impaired and who can, you can reason with, um, which is sometimes my dad and sometimes not, you know, I, I do, I speak to him, you know, and I, I, I wag my finger at him on, on FaceTime and I say, are you staying home? And, um, and he is making, he's being very compliant, which is not typical of his personality. Um, I hope he's not watching this on Facebook. I know he isn't. Um, but but that, that it's important that we take care of our, ourselves and our, our um, saving our own lives is the most important thing right now. I, I do, do want to say that one other thing though, that I think, you know, sometimes we feel as adult children or even grandchildren, we have to be the ones to have the conversation. I'm thinking back to, you know, Cindy was asking, you know, how do I balance a senior's desire, you know, to get out of the facility? I would suggest that you have the doctor talk to the, to the elder. I would have you think about Rabbi Josh or Pam, Pamela, you know, somebody that's not you. Because sometimes, um, and I'm talking about people who, you know, have their cognitive abilities. Um, sometimes they just, you know, there's a pushback from their own kids. And if you can find, or even a neighbor, you know, just somebody that they do respect, a colleague, um, that they might listen to in a different way. I wanted to, uh, since you were talking about different ways of the communicating, my favorite family moments from the last four months, uh, one on my wife's side and one on my side. On my wife's side, uh, family meals were when the whole family is gathered it's, you know, at, at a holiday uh, are fairly raucous events. Everyone's talking at once uh, and you know, everyone's having a great time. We did a family Zoom call that had three generations of my wife's family, Audrey's family, and there must have been 15 Zoom boxes. And uh, my father-in-law uh, was on the call, and it was just hilarious because, of course, everybody wants to have a side conversation while the main conversation is going on. My fav favorite moment on my side was that... Uh, I work at home, I write at home, uh, and I also uh, tend to the crops, namely the uh, vegetable and fruit uh, garden out back. And I had the experience, I was on the phone with my mother, and I was giving them, my mother and my sister, a video tour of the garden. Uh, because when you're on the 43rd floor of an apartment building in Chicago, you may not see a garden. At one point, my mother asked me if I would be quiet. Not that I hadn't heard that one before, but it was that there were birds. Traffic in Atlanta had ceased to the point where the highway a mile away from here, there was no, there was no uh, sound and the birds were loud enough. And I didn't think of it, but it was something uh, oral uh, that my mother picked up on that she had missed, that which she wasn't getting. So, you know, anyone with a garden and a relative who can handle uh, the technology, uh, that may be uh, one way of doing this. Uh, I'm looking in the chat box. I don't see any uh, fresh questions. So what I want to do here is I want to thank, I'm going to do my thanks now. I want to thank Rabbi Gottfried. I want to thank Nancy Kreisman. And I want to thank Haley, who is not seen, but without her, this program does not happen. And I, I want to offer, uh, in, the, in lieu of the, any other questions, I want to offer both the rabbi and, uh, and Nancy uh, a chance uh, to sum up uh, from a religious perspective, uh, from an advocacy perspective, uh, from a child and parent perspective. So uh, I, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll go to um, uh, Nancy first, and uh, it, she can wrap up here. And, and then we'll go to the rabbi and take, you know, if there's things you want to say that you haven't, please go ahead and let's do that now. Nancy, you're up. Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, when, when, when I think about this emotionally 
for all of us. You know, that one of the most difficult things that we're struggling with is the ambiguity of this whole thing. You know, we don't know when it's going to end. An ambiguous loss is very hard to grieve. And I think that we are all grieving. And so it's really important for all of us, you know, to acknowledge that to ourselves, to acknowledge it with our family members, and to give ourselves the space, the personal space, to feel the grief, to feel the loss, to feel the sadness. So I just want to leave people with that because I, I really do think that um, we are grieving. Is there anything on the advocacy component, which I know is very important to you, is there anything that you want to add or restate so that the folks watching this either live now or when they see the recording, uh, are there practical well, steps that need to be taken, Nancy, in this advocacy position? Again, I, I mean, I think just to reiterate that you've got to find at least one person, if they're living in an assisted living or nursing home, you need to find one person. It may, you know, it might not necessarily be a caregiver. It could be the director of dietary. I mean, my mother had a great relationship with the director of dietary. It could be the activity director who can be the eyes and ears for you, you know, that you can call them sort of be the point person that you check in with every day or week or whatever you agree to do with them. I think that's very important. Find out, you know, again, um, if they're having any difficulties with um, eating and medications and, you know, are, are they getting their clothes cleaned and changed? Um, what kinds of engagement are they involved in? And to really hear, you know, what are they doing with these elders? Rabbi, uh, the last word, uh, as appropriate, uh, and it's appropriate. The last word goes to the rabbi. Uh, so if you would give us a, uh, a close, uh, your thoughts on both the practical side and the spiritual side, please. Thank you. Um, I never get the last word at home, so thank you for that. <laughs> um, uh, I would I would echo everything that uh, Nancy said. Uh, it's like she read my mind. I think it's really important for us to be self-aware um, for those of us that are are facing these challenges now, which is all of us. You know, we're we're all um, in the midst of something that we have no control over, and um, and for a lot of us, I think it's brought up that we didn't have any control before, but we had an illusion of control. And so it's really important to, um, to be, uh, not just to be compassionate and kind and respectful and, um, of our elders <laughs> and uh, to take care of the people that we love, but to be really kind and compassionate with ourselves and allow ourselves to feel those feelings, to, to grieve the, what may seem like insignificant things, you know, um, uh, you know, it's something small that happens, but uh, to to allow ourselves to let go the 2020 thing that we were looking forward to, or this trip, or this wedding, it, it isn't what we thought it was going to be, and that's sad. And to sit with that, and then um, and and really, be, you know, allow allow uh, the time that takes some time to get past that, not to berate ourselves or. There was a lot about guilt in the chat, <laughs> um, you know. Yeah, it's guilt, it's very Jewish, okay? But at some point, um, it, it isn't serving anyone. So if we can, um, if we can somehow just uh, take a deep breath and remind ourselves that um, we have to take care of ourselves and be kind and compassionate to ourselves um, before we can help anyone else. It's like the oxygen mask in the airplane that I probably won't be on for another two years, right? When they tell you, put your mask on first. So. Um, that is my, my both Jewish and practical uh, uh, last word is um, we have to take care of ourselves. We have to give ourselves enough oxygen in order to care for the people that we love. Um, and I would also just like to end with a, a, a very practical um, message of gratitude. I want to thank everyone who participated in the call. Um, and I want to say to those of you that are watching on Facebook and to those of you who are in the Zoom call, this was meant just to be the beginning of the conversation. We knew that in an hour we wouldn't cover everything, 
Um, I will be sending uh, sometime later today or tomorrow, uh, early tomorrow, to everyone that registered, even if you're not here, we'll send you um, how to find the recording, which you can share with people. It'll be on the uh, CBH YouTube channel uh, shortly. It'll also be on the CBH Facebook page. Um, and we'll share our contact information because we're all, uh, I speak for all of us that we're happy uh, to continue the conversation personally, one-on-one. -on -one. Um, or uh, we're happy to do a, a part two if there's a need and a desire for that. But please, um, there are some amazing resources in our community. Um, we are all resources for one another. So to the extent that this conversation was meant to begin and open up a, a doorway, a portal for continued conversation, and also introduce you all to each other. Um, we're happy for everyone who is able to join us. Um, I also want to thank Dave <laughs> because nobody else would do it, so you got to give me the last word. But really thank uh, Nancy for being in the conversation with me, and uh, thank Dave for being our moderator, our excellence. And, um, and to thank Haley, which uh, Haley has already been thanked, who's our Zoom master, and the Jewish Federation of Greater Atlanta's Innovation Initiatives, who was our co-host, along with the congregation Beit Kaverim. And, um, and we'll send you contact information and resources, but really, thank you all for being here. Yes. <laughs> uh, and I guess uh, Haley, Haley's gonna uh, disconnect the call, so we're all gonna get, leave at the same time so we don't have a Jewish goodbye. So again, have a great day, everyone. <laughs>